We're continuing with our series, Knowing the Holy Spirit. And we're dealing with the topic, the gifts of the Spirit. Hi, I'm Jennifer Abigail Lawson Wallace, and welcome to Let the Truth Be Told. We're looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and so far we've looked at the gifts of uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and the gifts of faith. In this episode, we're going to continue with the other six gifts of the Spirit. We first look at the gifts of healing. Now you need to notice that it doesn't say gift of healing, but gifts of healings. So they are diverse healings. Hallelujah. Now this is the supernatural ability to supernaturally heal diverse kinds of diseases and infirmities without any natural means. If you have to give the person paracetamol, it's not the gifts of healing. It is a supernatural ability to heal. You remember Jesus said we should go and heal the sick. So we need the gifts of diverse healings to, in order to do that. These are healings that God performs supernaturally through the believer who possesses the gift. People who operate the gifts of healing, like I said, have that supernatural ability to heal the sick. The gifts of healings operate in diverse ways. It might be the healing of a blind person or a deaf person hearing or a lame walking, a mute speaking, limbs growing and organs that were not there before growing. Yes, it is possible. Jesus did it and Jesus said we will do it. There are many testimonies of, of these things happening. Testimonies even of people raising the dead. I have in my own life and ministry testimonies of seeing the sick healed. I believe that this is one thing that the Spirit of God is going to restore to the believer in such a way that almost every believer will be able to lay hands on the sick and heal them. Jesus healed the sick. He is our perfect example. You may read John chapter 9 verses 1 to 7 and also Luke chapter 5 verses 17 to 26. But all through the scriptures, in fact, there was one time that when people heard that Jesus was in the house, they brought the sick from everywhere. They even opened the roof to uh, let somebody through so that Jesus would heal them. Jesus said, the things that I do, you will do, and even more than that, because I go to the Father. He knew that after going to the Father, the Spirit would come and enable the believers to also heal the sick. Peter healed many, many who were sick. Oh, remember just after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 3, and you can read it from verses 1 to 16, that he and John got to the gate beautiful, and there was a man sitting there, a lame man, and Peter healed him, and he began to leap and jump and began to praise God. Many were healed. Even the Bible says that the shadow of Peter healed many as he passed. His shadow healed many. Those days are coming back, especially as we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives and in the church. The third example I want to give is Paul. He also healed many. You can read some of this in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 to 12. And Acts chapter 28, verses 7 to 9. God did awesome things through the disciples of Jesus Christ. And many were healed as a result. We need this now more than ever before. Hallelujah. The next gift I want us to look at is the gift of discernment of spirit. I think that we need this more than any of the gifts. I'm not saying it's more important than the other gifts. I'm saying that when we look at the way things are going and we look at the level of deception and we look at the confusion that is going all around, we need discernment. We need the Holy Spirit to endow us with the gift of discernment of spirits. Now it says discernment of spirits, plural. 
diacrisis, that's the Greek, plural spirit. So different spirits, including the true spirit of God, the demonic spirit, or even a human spirit operating. The gift of discernment of spirits is the ability to detect the true spirit, whether divine, demonic, or human, behind the acts and the manifestations taking around us. It's the ability to detect who is behind this, what kind of spirit is behind this activity. Because there is so much deception now, and if we are not able to detect that, we ourselves may end up being deceived. So the gift of discernment of spirit is an ability given by the Holy Spirit to discern the hidden source of spiritual power through which a person is thinking or speaking or acting. What is the source of what the person is doing? What is the power source? I said in a previous episode that when it comes to operating the things that are spiritual, we as human beings need a spirit to help us. And that is why the Holy Spirit, for example, the Holy Spirit had to come upon Jesus to get him from his human limited ability into his spiritual unlimited ability. And it's the same. And that's why psychics can get into the things of the spirit and do all kinds of things. But it's not the Holy Spirit who gets them to do those things because they do not have Christ in them. But for us, the Holy Spirit in us is working these things. And we need the ability to be able to discern what is at work at any moment in time. So the gift of the Spirit exposes or reveals if a person is either acting out through his own human spirit or through a demonic spirit or through the Spirit of God. It's as simple as that. That's why it says the gift of discernment of spirits. People with the gift of discernment of spirits are given supernatural insight into the spirit realm by the Holy Spirit. And by the operation of this gift, we'll know the true source. The gift of discernment of spirits can also help us to deepen our perception of the workings of the true spirit of God. When you have this gift, you are able to discern when the Holy Spirit is moving, how he is moving, what is he doing, what is the Holy Spirit saying. We need this gift more. Hallelujah. Especially in the area of the prophetic, where there is so much confusion and there is so much nonsense going on in the name of the prophetic. We need the gift of discernment of spirit to know who is behind those prophetic words being spoken. Examples of this, again, are Ananias and Sapphira. Paul was able to discern that they were lying, the spirit of lying. The most evident example can be found in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 19. Let's read and see what it will teach us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her masters saw that the hope of their prophet was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. This is the story of Paul and Silas in Philippi. The Bible says that as they went about their ministry, this young slave woman followed them and began to declare, these men are the servants of the Most High God. Isn't that interesting? What they were saying was true, that these men are the servants of the Most High God. But he was not saying it by the Spirit of God. He was saying it by another spirit. And the Holy Spirit was able to prompt Paul. And Paul, exercising the gift of discernment of spirit, was able to address that spirit. Because it is not up to the demonic spirit to reveal them. 
to the world. Hallelujah. He said, come out of it in Jesus' name. And the spirit came out. Hallelujah. So the gift of discernment of spirits is very necessary. Paul discerned the spirit in operation and cast it out. Some of our churches are full with people who say they are prophets, but it's really divination that is being used. And we need to be able to discern and to know so that we will not be deceived. We will not be deceived. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Hallelujah. So we are told to test the spirit. Don't be afraid to test the spirit. After all, if the thing is of the spirit, you have got nothing to lose. And the person really should not be upset. But if it's not of the spirit, then you know it's time to get away from it because you don't want to be deceived. May the Holy Spirit help us. May he give us discernment, but especially give us the spirit of discernment, especially at this time. Hallelujah. The sixth gift I want to talk about is the working of miracles. Now, the working of miracles is similar to the gifts of healings, but it's different because healings is focused solely on healings. But the working of miracles is a manifestation of divine power. That word miracles in the Greek is dunamis. Dunamis means power. It's the word dynamite comes from. So it's a manifestation of divine power to perform something that could not be done naturally. It operates by the dynamic force of the Holy Spirit against natural laws. A miracle is a sovereign act of the Spirit of God that works irrespective of and against natural laws or orders. It is a supernatural intervention in the course of nature. And this is a gift the Spirit of God gives to some. People with the gift of miracles manifest exceptional powers and in the name of Jesus perform things that cannot be ascribed to human power or human strength, human wisdom, intelligence, ability, or even human performance. They can't, it just will not happen. It has to be a miracle. When I was a young Christian, you know, we saw more of these things. It was amazing. There was one that happened which blew our mind. I was a, a young Christian in Ghana. We were in secondary school, going into university, teenagers and everything. And we had just learned about the Holy Spirit. And I mean, I was not one of those people then, but there were people who were so full of faith and uh, did mighty things. And I remember once there was a petrol crisis in Ghana and there was no petrol. And a group of young students had to drive from Kumasi to Accra, which is four hours journey by road. They had no petrol and they took water and prayed over it and poured the water into the petrol tank and drove from Kumasi to Accra. Now that is a miracle. And that is the sort of thing that the gift of working of miracles enables you to do. Hallelujah. The purpose of this gift is not for personal gain, but that God wants to intervene in a natural process or condition to show his power and might, or even to bring provision. The Bible is packed with records and stories of miracles which demonstrate the power and mercy of God. Jesus himself did many miracles. He turned water into wine. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, we have the story of Jesus saying to Peter and, and co, after they had toiled all night and had caught no fish, 
Jesus comes along and in broad daylight says to them, throw your net into the deep. You don't fish during the daytime. It's nighttime that they catch fish. And they said, we have done it over again. We've toiled all night. Jesus said, do it again. And they did it. And they had a massive catch of fish. Hallelujah. Even Peter raising Dorcas from the dead. That's a miracle. Raising the dead is part of the uh, working of miracles. If you read Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 42, and Acts chapter 19, verse 11, also Acts chapter 28, verses 3 to 6, you will have records of miracles done by both Paul and Peter. In the Old Testament, like I said, we have Elijah, and Elisha performing so many miracles. Oh, the days of miracles are needed. We need for the world to see the supernatural hand of God. Oh, look at Joshua, the sun stopping for Joshua. That is a miracle. The same God who did these things is the same God who dwells in us by his spirit. And the same God who wants to work these things in us wants to empower the church. Church, it's time we gave ourselves to the Lord. We gave ourselves to his word. We gave ourselves to the Holy Spirit to work these things in us, especially faith. It is time we started believing that God can do these things through us again. Look, my prayer these days is that, Lord, unless you're not serious about your son's kingdom, but if you are, Work your power in us. Give us the ability to do the miracles that Jesus said we will do. Let your spirit work through us. I don't know, that is my earnest prayer. And I believe we're going to see God do mighty things through us. Because Jesus is coming soon. Hallelujah. The next gift is the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. Now, this is a major issue because... There are people around who have the gift of prophecy and they are calling themselves prophets. The gift of prophecy is different from the office of the prophet. They are two different things. Remember in the previous episode when we started this teaching on the gifts of the spirit, I said that there are three areas of gifts. One is the gifts of the spirit. And then we have the fivefold ministry, and then we have the ministerial gifts. And we are focusing on the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of prophecy is different from the fivefold ministry of the prophet. Not everybody who has the gift of prophecy is a prophet, and we need to understand that. And that's the problem we have now. There are too many people who have the gift of prophecy posturing as prophets and bringing all kinds of confusion into the body. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. And I pray that the Lord brings correction in the body so that the body can work in a better way. But the gift of prophecy in the Greek prophetia is to communicate a divine revelation or truth. To prophesy is to communicate a divine revelation or truth or to communicate something that is hidden, or to predict some future event. So somebody brings a prophecy. It is communicating or revealing something. Now the Hebrew word for prophecy is naba. It means to bubble up, to bubble up, to let words flow in abundance. Sometimes through singing or speaking under a divine inspiration. Actually, it also means to speak like a madman because the things you are saying don't seem to make sense or fit within what is happening currently. Hallelujah. But the gift of prophecy is the God-given ability to receive and reveal truth and proclaim it in a timely manner and relevant manner. And this often brings understanding or correction, or repentance, or to build up the church, to edify the church. This is a sudden inspiration by the Holy Spirit that brings exhortation to the body of Christ. 
Joel, for instance, prophesied that in the last days, this gift will be given to all believers as part of the manifestation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that the days when Joel prophesied it, people thought, what is this man babbling about? What is he talking about? A prophecy is from God and is divinely inspired. And it comes forth in a language that is understood by those hearing it. And it it's often works with uh, the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge. But it is different. Hallelujah. Sometimes prophecy is just an inspiration to bring forth, even from the scriptures, the mind and counsel of God at any given situation. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3 tells us that prophecy comes forth to do three things. One, to edify the believers. That's to build up the believers, to encourage and build up. Then secondly, to exhort the believers. But thirdly, to encourage and comfort the believers. So to edify, prophecy comes to edify, to exhort, and to comfort. If the prophecy comes and is producing fear in you, and there is nothing in it to help you, even if you're wrong, to correct it, then you need to question where it's coming from. I remember being in a meeting many years ago, and a prophecy came forth, I am the Lord, and I will kill all of you because you are in sin. What's the meaning of that? Why would God come to his children or send a word to his children that I'm about to kill all of you? You know instantly that that is not from God. So all those who are lying to you, telling you all kinds of things, your mother-in-law is doing this, this is happening, that you need to question all of them. Because prophecy comes to edify you. It comes to exhort, lift you up, and it comes to encourage. This is the purpose of prophecy. Hallelujah. And this is the gift that Paul encouraged all believers to have. He says, strive for prophecy. Because prophecy is profitable to the church. We build ourselves through prophecy. We exhort. We comfort. Hallelujah. Often, like I said, it flows from the word, the word of God to the body of Christ. And I will encourage you to ask the Lord to give you the gift of prophecy. Prophetic utterances, of course, must be evaluated and judged by all believers. And it must be in line with scripture. When you have a prophetic word, please ask a mature believer or other believers to judge it, to weigh it, to see if it is aligned in, with scripture. For instance, that prophecy that came, that I, I will kill all of you, that is not in line with scripture. Even if there was sin in the camp, the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse sin. And what God would seek is for us rather to come to repentance rather than that I will kill you. There are many examples of prophecy in the Bible. Jesus prophesied. Philip had four daughters who prophesied. This is in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30. And all through the book of Acts, we, we see the gift of prophecy in action. Hallelujah. This is the end of this episode. We'll be continuing with this teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit next time. So see you soon. God bless.